Uh, welcome everybody to the call. Uh, tonight we have with us Joel Wilmoth, who is the um, founder and uh, co-owner of uh, Wilmoth uh, Group Property Management out of Indianapolis. It is a property management company that I use for my Indianapolis uh, properties. And Joel is a uh, Indiana and Florida licensed broker, uh, as well as a realtor and uh, member of National Association of uh, uh, Property Managers. And, uh, you know, he is founder and co-owner of the business, and yet he has a boss. He reports to his uh, wife, Jennifer Wilmoth. That's going to be a lot of pressure. It's been a it's been a 20 years of learning how to work with your wife. <laughs> nice. Yeah. My wife yeah. and I just started a business. And I still don't have it down yet. <laughs> she would tell you I screw up every day. Well, and and uh, here I was I was watching on your on your website says avoid you avoid uh, cold weather and snow. Uh, you consider <laughs> baseball the national pastime. And you receive companionship and business consulting from a dog named Buddy. I had to read that one. Yep. In fact, Buddy was going to come in here with me. I thought he was going to do the podcast with me, but he <laughs> he bagged out at the last minute. <laughs> it's okay. We'll have it recorded so you can see it later on. Okay. Uh, speaking of which, maybe I could just share my screen real quick to, to show you guys. I haven't done this in a while. Um, I don't know if everybody's aware or not, but um, uh, let's see. So I'm going to see if I can share my screen here. Share screen, this one right here, share. Okay, so whenever you guys are able to see my screen, I can show you here what I'm talking about. Joel, can you see it right now? I can, yes. Okay, great. So uh, basically this is the uh, this is a website for our group. It is club500.us. And if you go to this website, you'll be able to see um, just information about our group, but also, I guess most importantly, you'll be able to see the videos here from all of our previous calls. So uh, our recording from tonight is going to be on there by tomorrow, and uh, you guys are going to be able to see the recording if anybody has to cut out earlier. Um, and, and ever since we started doing this and or doing Facebook Lives or things like that, uh, I've noticed a lot more people are watching uh, after uh, the event at their own leisure. So that's uh, perfectly good. Hopefully this helps you guys and you know, there's some fun other things here. You can see photos from what our club used to look like pre-COVID. So that was that was fun times. So hopefully we can get back to that uh, uh, very soon. So anyways, that's uh, some information about our club. So I'm going to stop the share now. And I want to jump right into it, Joel. I'm, I, I was looking forward to this. And we um, our, our original meeting time was supposed to be on the 12th. Yeah. Uh, which would have been closer to the end of the eviction uh, moratorium. But now it's been, what, a month? Not quite, but yeah, we're getting we're getting uh, three weeks. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So the eviction moratorium, just to remind everybody, it uh, it went into effect. Uh, it was started by, I guess, the the CDC initiated. Is that right? Yeah. It, you know, uh, I don't want to politicize it. It basically was supported by two different uh, political party elected presidents, and uh, started under. Uh, Trump and continued under Biden, but it was done through the executive branch, through the uh, CDC's, um, the disease control department. Perfect. Perfect. Well, I'm, I'm, I appreciate that. We, we stay very apolitical on, uh, on our, uh, on our pod. So, um, so yeah, so it was started by originally, I guess, from the CDC and then the executive branch gets involved and, uh, and it, it lasted for how long? Started, um, September 4th of 2020, and uh, the Supreme Court, I, th I believe, I thought I had that date written down, but I, th I think uh, it was August 26th. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought around that time frame. So that is a long time for a landlord. So during the eviction moratorium in all 50 states, you could not evict anyone for any reason. Is that correct? Well, there were um, limitations on it, but they, it was a pretty wide door. Basically, if you, if you summarized it, a tenant just needed to say that they'd been adversely affected by COVID. Okay, so if I remember correctly, basically, they didn't actually have to lose a job. They didn't actually have to lose income. They didn't actually have to, all they have to do is say that they were affected. Or that they'd be threatened by being evicted and not having any place to move to. Okay. So I guess, I mean, you run, uh, you know, I have a sample of properties uh, that are mine, that are rentals. 
this so I can kind of extrapolate from my sample, but how how was everyone affected in, in Indianapolis? How many units do you guys manage? Well, we manage about a thousand units in central Indiana. Well, wow. uh, the, the CDC. The, so, you know, a quick summary of, of this. When uh, when COVID started, you know, to me, our tenants that were um, people that had really actually been adversely affected by COVID actually tried to work with their payments. But the people that were going to be bad tenants pre-COVID were not going to do really anything to try to make payments or change anything. They just kind of hid behind any rules that went in place. And most areas initially in like March or April of 2020, there were local moratoriums that, that went into place. And um, it was not until September that there was an actual federal moratorium. And, and it's also important to distinguish that because there's a lot of different moratoriums. Um, there is still in place until the 1st of October, a moratorium on evicting people that are in homes that are insured with a federal mortgage. So that did not go away. That was, for, for, for whatever reason, not part of the you know, Supreme Court decision. The Supreme Court decision was, you know, that thing with, with the uh, insured mortgages was really done within those agencies where the CDC was directly directed toward renters and protecting renters. And so the, the, the Centers for Disease Control basically produced a document that was a declaration that any tenant could sign that had certain conditions associated with it, but it, but it generally was just, I've been affected by COVID. I would be negatively affected if I had to, you know, if I was evicted or if I had to leave my current housing. And um, initially in, no, in, in September of 2020, you know, my initial reaction was this is unconstitutional. A, a branch of the government doesn't have the right to break contracts that private businesses. It, it, it has to be legislated. And that was always the argument. Um, initially, though, even in September, pre-vaccinations, it was a little more difficult to, to make those arguments because um, arguably, you know, people didn't have places they could go and it might have exacerbated the pandemic. But as the you know, situation with vaccinations improved and they were being given away to anybody who wanted one. In my own personal opinion, not only did the unconstitutionality of it not make sense, but the whole fact that, that there was continuing to be an effort to provide this protection um, on the sake of um, the risk of people being exposed to COVID um, that that really started to reach two different areas, the unconstitutionality and the morality of it. Um, the Supreme Court, so, so initially it was only supposed to be in place until um, December 31st. Uh, December 27th, the Trump administration extended it to January 31st, basically on the idea that we're going to let the Biden administration decide what to do with this rule. It was then extended until March 31st, again until June 30th, and then again until July 21st when it was supposed to end. And it did, I'm sorry, July 31st, and it was, it did end for three or four days. And in the month of July, the Supreme Court had list, had, had heard um, legal cases that had come up that had been sponsored actually by the Georgia and Alabama Board of Realtors. And the Supreme Court had ruled that it needed to end. It was, a, it was an unconstitutional ruling that a, a, a branch of government didn't have the right to, to make a, you know, protect, interfere with contracts. So um, 
July 31st, for a few days in early August, there were um, evictions that took place with people that had um, filed the CDC declaration. That only happened if you had an attorney that had been rolling cases every time this thing got extended, basically rescheduling the case for the next extension date. We had eviction cases that had been extended five times, and our attorney had gone ahead and scheduled those again, like on August 1st or August 2nd, and we, we were successful. We had some evictions that took place, and, and mind you, these are people, we're not wanting to put people on the street. These are just people that that hadn't made a payment in, in nine months, and they weren't going to make a payment. And there was no way they could ever catch up, which was one of the things in the declaration that they would sign that said, we still understand we are supposed to make payments as we can. And we uh, know that we owe and will pay, you know, in full our rent. Well, when you get up to $10,000 money, you know, they're, they're not, there's no way that it's going to happen. This went on too long. The whole idea of rental assistance, which we can talk about in a minute, was supposed to be a way to solve some of those people who had those kinds of obligations. But um, finishing the timeline of the CDC uh, around June or June, August 3rd, the Biden administration tweaked the, the rule a little bit with the CDC and extended it until October 3rd, basically daring the Supreme Court to, um, to interfere again. And the Supreme Court did, they blocked it in late August, said that it was unconstitutional and that the CDC, any, any eviction moratoriums that were to take place had to be legislated and not created through a branch of the government. So I am not an attorney. I am not a history doctor or anything else. I, I'm just giving you kind of the, the quick and dirty summary of a very complicated timeline. And, um, and what makes it more complicated is that uh, some states have their own eviction moratoriums on top of that. So I know in, right now in New York, the federal moratorium has ended, but the state moratorium is still on. Yeah, in fact, I was going to mention there's there's I think eight states here that still have moratoriums, and if you live in one of those states, you need to be familiar with them because they're all different. California, Washington D.C., which is not a state, Illinois, Minnesota, New Jersey, uh, New Mexico, New York, and state of Washington still have their own statewide eviction moratoriums. Um, most of them, I believe, were, were scheduled to end in October, but I think New York was one of the worst ones, if I recall. I think it's through January. Yeah. I, I could check that, but I believe that's how long it lasts. So, um, you know, it, it, it now in, in a place like Indiana, where we are um, now dealing with more with backlog in the courts and the cases and, and that it's, you know, we're the the timelines of, of getting these cases heard now is really extended but so let's let's talk about that so it, before the eviction moratorium in indiana for example because i mean every state is different depending on whether it's a i can't remember how if it's a judicial state or whatever but how does how does it work in indiana pre moratorium if you're trying to evict someone how long does it normally take on average are you able to get a tenant out in a month from filing yeah, I think that would be normal. Um, I almost forget what normal was like, but um, it was, uh, you go back to 2019, you know, we would, we could file, probably have a hearing within 10 to 14 days, uh, usually have about 10 days to 14 days of, of possession after the hearing. And, and then there, the, the tenant was supposed to be out as a timeline. Um, now, most of the cases as they're getting scheduled now are probably three weeks to get scheduled. The one thing that's that's interesting that our judges I'm seeing frequently right now is that um, they're basically giving the tenant the opportunity to vacate without an eviction on their record, yeah. which is going to be a shame because, you know, ultimately you're going to have to really dig into the court cases for each applicant if you're going to really determine if somebody was involved in this. Um, 
they're not going to uh, involved in, in not making the rent payments through this time period. Um, and, and I know in some states, I've heard in New York, you can't even now use eviction history as a as a uh, approval process, that, that that history is not permitted for approvals now. I'm fairly new to New York, so I'm still learning. But uh, but yeah, that if, if there's a state who will do that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's going to be trying to determine rental history is going to be, I think, very complex going forward because of all these issues. Um, so theoretically, but, you could have somebody who was in a property for a year, uh, didn't pay rent for a year, just kind of took advantage of the program, regardless yeah. of being affected or not affected, took advantage of the program for a year, walked out uh, and with no ding to credit history, because that was a part of it, correct? Credit history as well? Well, you know, I, here's, here's how ultimately credit history happens is either the landlord reports it or you ultimately get a judgment for damages um, and damages can be nothing more than unpaid rent. Mm -hmm. There has been nothing that says that the unpaid rent through the CDC eviction moratorium is somehow forgiven or you know, taken away. So that obligation still is there. Um, it's up to a, a landlord to decide if they want to pursue those damages cases. That's really the, the ultimate question. And it, and it becomes, the question is it, it, it's good money versus bad. You're, you're gonna spend money to get a judgment that will end up on the applicant or on, on a person's credit report that becomes a red flag for somebody who's doing underwriting of applications. But the landlord's gonna basically, in order to obtain that judgment, is gonna spend court costs and legal time in order to get that. And then they're gonna have to collect on it. And collection, particularly on you know, some, of these, some of these folks is gonna be very, very difficult. Yeah, I've noticed that as well. I mean. I I have to say, through COVID, I was impressed at how many tenants actually were paying rent and were paying yeah. on time. <clears throat> I would say probably, you know, um, five percent in my case were um, were not paying rent, but even those were uh, actually trying to get assistance and got approved for assistance, and so we got uh, payments eventually uh, from from the government. But it's one hard thing is when you get the judgment, as you know, it's not that easy to collect. Yeah. Because, you know, wage garnishments are the easiest uh, way to do that, but you have to know their new place of residence. You have to know their new place of work. And that's not easy to get. And then you've got to get the employer to complete, uh, you know, like an interrogatory that, that confirms they're an employee there. And, yeah, it, it's very time consuming. And by the time that you complete that, you may they may be on to some other job. Um, I mean, collection, I, I tell any landlord, if, if, if they're really hoping to recover through collection, then that's probably the wrong, you know, <laughs> that's a wrong wish because it just is not going to be a likely recovery scenario. In most cases, you do, you, you pursue damages for the principle of the thing, going back to your question. Um, it gets it gets a mark on their credit report. It, it shows a judgment. It shows that they owe somebody money. And if they ever do decide they want to buy a car, you know, uh, through, you know, borrowing money through a bank, or anywhere, uh, they're, they're going to ultimately be faced with the dilemma of trying to pay that or settle that judgment with you, yeah. um, which does happen every now and then. So yeah, I guess they're um, you know the, you can go for the wage garnishments after a judgment, or you can uh, turn it over to a collection agency, which typically they'll take about a thirty percent cut if they're able to collect. Correct. But a lot of times they're not able to collect, so you don't really get anything for that at all. Right. Right. I've never it, it never made sense to me really. If you if you you know fill up gas at a gas station and you don't pay for it, or you pay with a bad card, or you get write a bad check they know where you live. And if it's, you know, 200 bucks, they will find you. 
But if if a tenant owes a landlord five thousand dollars and a judge says yes, you you actually are entitled to that money. They owe you that money, but we can't garnish wages because we don't know where they work. I've never really understood why why there's a difference. Well, we and I would suggest anybody this. We use a, a attorney. To me, it's worth the potential cost. Um, and they do keep a third, but, but here's what he does. He, every month takes the, he, he's got to have their social. And that's a big problem that a lot of times when we take over portfolios of properties, we do not receive whether it was ever obtained or not, but we don't receive enough background information on the tenant to be able to, to do what would ultimately be needed in a collection scenario. But if you have their social security and, and secondarily their driver's license, uh, but mostly social. They once a month do a, a computer program with the Indiana workforce and they, uh, it, you know, if someone's working, they'll, they'll get a match, they'll find them. Okay, so, that, that's what I need. Okay, I didn't know, I didn't know about that. Yeah, and, and, but, but you know, this is where using an attorney instead of a collection agency, are you trying to collect it yourself? Um, you know, I think it increases your odds because they do run it every month, at least the one we use. Um, and he he will get hits and he'll, you know, they'll find they've gone back to work. And then we start the process of trying to, um, to, to garnish. Garnishment is your first choice, but it's still a um, low risk game. I mean, there's a lot of better ways and things to do with your time and money. Okay. Yeah, I think so you know, that's, that's the way to go. You know, I and I guess I don't know if you want to jump to it or not, but I, I think you know part of the whole theory through the uh, CDC eviction moratoriums has been this rental assistance, these rental assistance funds, and the the amount of money that the federal government has put out to the states to administer rental assistance, and you know it. it the funds are significant. There, there's a lot of money. There's more money than there is manpower to distribute it, which has created problems. Because if you, in, at least in Indiana um, and the various programs here, and I think this is a fairly, this is fairly a constant. Um, as a landlord, when when you get notice that that your tenant has applied for rental assistance, there's usually something on the landlord side that you need to complete. But part of what you're completing, there will be a, a statement that you will not evict, you will not pursue collection for 45 days while they have time to process the rental assistance application. 45 days, I think, or until they get declined, the tenant gets declined. Um, none of these cases are getting done in 45 days. So you get to the point where you find that you're on day 48 and your tenant's not paying rent because once they apply for rental assistance, they just pretty much stop paying rent. Um, and you have to make a decision. Do I wait to see if, if any money is going to really come out of this because I, I, I don't know if they're going to qualify or not, or do I move forward and, and go ahead and evict? But now we've added another 45 days onto the timeline in the hope that we're going to get rental assistance. And, you know, I, I think if there's, you know, two things that your um, people in your program, your members in your program should really be um, pursuing with, with their uh, legislators and people who are involved in, in local government in particular, one of them is whatever is needed to get these rental pro assistance programs functioning in a much more, a much faster method. And, and in fact, allow the landlords to apply upfront for the tenant. Don't expect the tenant to, to make those applications. Um, there's a lot of money. I just, I got this figure last week that um, Indianapolis, Metropolitan Indianapolis, which is running its own rental assistance program, has received $187.6 million in federal money to cover rent. And so far, they've only distributed 60 million of it, a third. Wow. So, wow. you know, we're evicting people and they may be eligible, but 
if, if they have to make application and we have sent multiple messages out to people, we have done, you know, we push and we push, but for whatever reason, you know, that, that, that angle, when everybody complains about we're evicting people, there's rental money available. Why, you know, mean big, bad landlords wait for the rental money. Well, you know, it, the system's going to have to be run better or differently. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing is, I think people are going to really have to watch their um, legal system, their, the, the, their legislators, because even Today, um, there is a new bill that was introduced in Congress, and this is this is the risk going forward, and it's called the, uh, hold on and I'll get the name of it, but it was introduced by Elizabeth Warren and Cori Bush, and it's called the Keeping Renters Safe Act of 2021, and its aim, aim is to protect, protect renters from eviction by amending section 361 of the Public Health Service Act to grant Health and Her Human Services and the CDC permanent authority to implement federal eviction moratoriums to address public health crisis. Ouch. So this is probably just the first of these bills. And you know, people, at least I know that are close to the lawmaking process tell me that there's not enough votes for these kind of bills to pass. But anyone that has interests in owning rental properties needs to watch this and needs to make it known to their legislators that, you know, this is, there's a landlord, there's another person on the other side of this contract. And uh, there's a lot of people that are affected when the landlord is not getting his money. Yeah, I think a lot of his or her money, excuse me. Yes. And I think there's a lot of misconception out there, both with, uh, I don't know if there is with legislatures or, or not, but I know there is with, with tenants for sure. And, you know, tenants always think that if, if the rent is $1,200, then the, the landlord is making $1,200 a month. Yeah. And, uh, and that's definitely not the case. So as we've seen during COVID, if tenants stop paying, a lot of times landlord, landlords go under and they, they're unable to meet their bills. Yeah. I, I mean, think about everything from, um, you know, the cities and, and, and their efforts that they want properties to, you know, neighborhoods to look nice. And the, the, the same tenant that's not paying his rents, probably they're not paying, they're not taking care of their, their property. And the landlord that might have stepped in to do that when they were receiving rent, who hasn't received rent for six months, probably doesn't have the money to to take care of that property. So the property and the values deteriorate. And at the same time, you know, the, the, the handyman or, or the other vendors that they use, that they're not getting the work that they might have done because the, the money's not, the, the, you know, the landlord's not willing to do the things they need to do to that property. Subsequently, the tenant's living in worse conditions too. Um, it, it, you know, I, the system was never designed to work this way. So uh, one thing to hear about it on the news, and you know, we've, we've all been bombarded with it for a long time now, but you're right there on the ground. You've got over a thousand units under management in central Indiana. What, what was it like? Um, what, what percentage of tenants would you say were not paying rent as a result of uh, this program? I think it's very similar to the number you gave, 5%. Okay. I, I, I really think we, um, you know, initially we kept those numbers, but then to me, it became harder to, to really know um, who was taking advantage and who wasn't. Um, the numbers grew where it was almost like you took a block. And, and I would say at one point in time, it was probably up to 8% or more, but that, there was that 3 or 4%. There were just people that were taking advantage. There was no they, they weren't going to make any payments and weren't making partial payments. And, you know, I, I know this sounds like um, real heavy handed talk, but my experience, and I've been doing this since 1994, is that when somebody's sincere and they really, they want, they're not trying to take advantage of you or anybody else, they communicate with you. And they, they, they ask for help. They try to find solutions. Even if they you know, can't make the full payment, they try to find solutions. 
So the people that, to me, went undercover, used the CD, you know, and they, most of them used the CDC. Um, one of the things we started doing with the CDC when it happened is that one of the, the, the parts of the declaration is that they, that the tenant had to state that they would make every effort possible to obtain uh, rental assistance funds. So as soon as we received a CDC, we communicated to them, okay, you are under an obligation to file for rental assistance. Well, the rental assistance terms, at least in Indiana, were such that if the third party reviewing rental assistance did not approve, basically came to the determination that the tenant was not really affected by COVID negatively, um, we were lining up cases to go back to the court and say, okay, they filed the CDC, we're, we're going to complain that this was you know, illegal, that they, they really could not have been protected by the CDC because Marion County just turned them down and said they were not affected by COVID. We had a, we had a bunch of those cases lined up when the Supreme Court got involved. So okay. I'm giving you a really long answer, but but to me, there were two different types of people. There were people who were legitimately needing help, and they were the same ones who were communicating yesterday and today. And then there was just a group who were going undercover, hiding. Yeah, and I was treating them differently as well during the during the pandemic because you could definitely tell the ones who were, who were trying. Uh, I've had tenants that you know who were late late by a month, and then the next month they would completely pay back everything. And they're they're late. Yeah. And, uh, and over time, they got back on track and were, were perfectly fine. So we were treating those definitely differently, not just because of the moratorium, but just also on a human level. I mean, you can kind of tell who's really trying and who's not. <clears throat> so yeah, we had that. Yeah, we had that, too. We had you know people that were totally protected by the CDC and they brought their rent current. I mean, over nine months or whatever. Yeah, almost a year. Um, that's not asking too much. If you're really sincere about it, you know, you're having trouble in September of 2020. By July of 2021, you've either worked it out or you were never going to work it out. Yeah. So now, okay, the eviction bin is over. It's been, what, three weeks. Um, how long is it taking now or how long do you foresee it taking with the backlog of cases? I'm sure everybody's trying to do the same thing right now with the evictions. How long is it going to take on average? Well, I can only go on some cases that we had. Um, and we've done really well, actually. And I think it's because we had the cases lined up. But mm -hmm. um, the, we, we had cases that we, we had cases we filed immediately when the Supreme Court blocked the CDC because our rolling habit had rolled like the cases we had that were protected by the CDC, we had already rolled them in scheduled cases for October 3rd, which was when the Supreme Court, when, when Biden's administration's latest renewal was supposed to end. So we had rolled cases to that. We couldn't get those renewed, which was too bad. I mean, we couldn't back them up and say, okay, now we want that case to be heard August 25th. Okay. But we did have new cases we filed, and this is the only answer that I can really give you right now this soon, that, so it's a little unfair, unfortunately. Some owners were, are waiting because of how we had played this with the cases being set up. And we had new cases we filed that have been heard, and we're getting possession this next week between okay. Okay. really between uh, Monday through the 30th. From your experience, how does it go with pandemic or no pandemic? Uh, for the most part, how does it go with uh, once you get the eviction, um, you win the eviction, do they typically leave or do you have to get the sheriff out there? We've had um, initially, particularly uh, the first couple of weeks of September, and, and those were cases, mind you, that people didn't file the CDC. And I mean, I guess it's only fair to say not everybody filed the CDC. Uh, there were a lot of people who didn't know about it or just didn't take advantage of it. And so those cases, there were still evictions going on. Um, 
but we ran into people that would say, well, you can't evict me. Like they didn't ever go to court. They didn't really pay attention to the fact that a, a judgment had been issued that they had to give up possession. And we would show up on the day and they'd say, well, you can't evict me. I'm protected. The tenants didn't understand. So we would give them a little extra time and um, expect them to leave. And often they didn't. And we had to get the sheriff. That was more frequent over really the last few months than it had probably ever been. I would just say this week is the first time that we are seeing that people are vacating as they're supposed to. And we're, we're not having this issue. Like the people, like we're going to the house on the day that they're supposed to be out and they're out. Okay. Now in your mind, in your opinion, do you think that what's happening now with evictions, if that it's going to materially affect the availability of rental units or the, the supply, I guess, of rental units on the market that would affect anything? That's a real tough question. I mean, obviously, everybody knows that the whole inventory of supply, you know, the supply and demand have been way out of whack, which has been interesting because even in the investment market, um, there's two camps. I mean, it's it's kind of black and white. You're either you're either in and you're taking advantage of this moment to try to buy property, or you're out and sick of it and you just don't want to have anything else to do with it. Yeah. Um, so we've had both, and I, it's been, an, I'd say, an equilibrium. There, there's been people on both sides of that equation, and it, there hasn't really been a significant bump one way or the other, ultimately. <clears throat> um, I, I, I have to think, you know, rental real estate is still one of your, you know, best investments that, that exists because of, uh, not not just cash flow, which is what everybody talks about with Indiana in particular, but also just the the appreciation, the fact that you have a, an asset that even if you buy it with debt, that you're you're going to reduce that debt and you're going to have an asset at some point in time that that is going to have value that has no um, leverage against it at all. Um, that's going to still come through, and you know in the last couple of days, the stock market has gone, made some jumps down. And I think every time that happens and it does its correction, that causes people to move and consider real estate again. So, you so know, it, tax benefits that you've got the uh, hedge against correct. and it all adds up to, uh, to really good things. Yeah. I, I, I just don't, I, I think, yeah, this has been a disruptive time, no doubt, but the fundamentals of, of it, uh, you know, the only only real thing that you have are always the political risk. And the only real political risk that I, you know, hear talk of and continue to talk of is the section, the 138s, I believe, I'm not, so, I'm not sure I got that number right, but spitting it off the top of my head, the exchange rules, um, they may tighten those up and clamp those up some. Okay. 1031 exchanges? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I've heard that. Uh, we actually had... Um... We had a guest on, uh, uh, was it a couple of weeks ago, uh, talking about that, and he was a, an expert on uh, 1031 exchanges. So if anybody wants to know more about that, go to club500.us under videos. You can see the recording of that uh, of that podcast when we had uh, that guest on the show. So uh, one last thing I wanted to say about the supply. I know in Indianapolis uh, in particular, uh, looking at reports, uh, this was maybe a year or two years ago, Indianapolis was marked as having hyper supply or oversupply of rentals. And I always found that really funny because for my portfolio, I have a, the properties in Georgia, I have properties in Indiana and Pennsylvania. Indiana or Indianapolis by far has had the highest occupancy. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I'm not familiar with that study. I, <laughs> you know, I... You know, it partially, sometimes when people do these studies too, you have to look at what what they define as the look as Indianapolis, and Indianapolis is like any metropolitan area, I guess, where you 
have the city and if you say the city of Indianapolis, you know, what's the composition? Um, you know, it, it probably is higher on renters. Um, it, it, that's what you said, right? That the well, they were the, saying hyper supply of rental units, uh, supply, but, but supply that, versus demand. But I, I didn't see that myself. I mean, it seems like we've had almost 100% occupancy over the last few years. So they were saying that the supply far exceeded the demand. Yeah, this was, I think it was about like two years ago, actually, that I saw this study. So, um, but I remember thinking it didn't, it didn't jive with what I was seeing there because uh, our units were getting rented very quickly and we didn't really have much vacancy. Yeah, I, I don't have the numbers right in front of me right now, but um, if anything, that what's happened this year is, is similar to the uh, buyer market for someone, for their owner occupied. It's the, 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 the every property has multiple applications and it, okay. it doesn't, it, as long as it's priced correctly. I, and that's one thing maybe a little different in Indianapolis is that we haven't had this huge uh, supply demand bump in, in the rental rate, um, but, but nothing staying on the market long at all. Good. Yeah. All right, so I, I don't, I don't know what exactly they meant by that, but that doesn't, I, I, we don't see that. Perfect. Well, that's good. I'm actually glad that, that that I saw that because I thought maybe more for us. <laughs> maybe somebody will see that and won't buy there. But I I, I love it. I think uh, I think Indianapolis has done really. I mean, it's done really well for us. So I, I kind of wish we bought more units back then. Um, yeah, we we literally see. I mean, for everybody that gets out of the market, it seems like we get a new phone call from somebody that wants to get into the market. So and to me, it's, it's a regular cycle. And, and unfortunately, I've been doing this for so long, it, it, even through every other blip in the economy, we've continued to see this cycle in this market. And, and most of it is because, you know, this is one of those markets where you, you really do have uh, a nice rental uh, number available to you for the acquisition cost itself. Perfect. Uh, I wanted to kind of open it up a little bit to see if anybody has any questions uh, on the call right now. I uh, Let me see here. I saw Joe Holmes earlier. I know he had some thoughts on it, but I don't see him anymore. I think he might've had to go. I bored him. If anybody, no, <laughs> no, definitely not. He was very interested in this one, but uh, Anybody have any questions? You guys uh, feel free to unmute yourself at this point. Uh, we can uh, we can get those answered. If not, that just means we've done a really fantastic job covering this, Joel. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's just it's a hard topic to. Uh, it, it is kind of what it is. I have to say. Yeah, I do think it's important that that your members watch what's going on with their local legislators. That is for any landlord right now going to be really, really important. Well, and I've, I've learned something because I, I think uh, uh, going through a lawyer, being able to look up by social security number, whether that person works at a new workplace, um, you know, once a month or whatever, and that, that's huge. I mean, I've got a judgment right now that if, if it came through, it would be really nice. So we're definitely going to try that. The property's in Georgia, so I hope- I was going to ask you, if it's one of us, ours, we should no. have that in process. No, <laughs> no, that, yeah. I haven't had any issues in, uh, in Indy. Well, that's a good thing. Yeah. Well, perfect. <laughs> I think we're, yeah, we did a good job uh, covering it. I, I want to thank you again for, for coming. I know that you know, on the 12th, we were going to do it. So sorry again about that. We didn't uh, manage to, to meet up on the on the 12th, but thanks for coming anyway. This was really great and uh, super useful. And I wanted to give our members a chance to contact you if they if they need to, or if anybody has uh, units in Indianapolis or thinking about getting units in Indianapolis. I think we also have some turnkey properties available there. So if anybody uh, wants to get in touch with you, what is the best way? Probably the easiest thing is to uh, email me at joel, J-O-E-L, at... Wilmoth Group, it's W-I-L-M-O-T-H-G-R-O-U-P.com. Joel at wilmothgroup.com. I also typed and posted that in a chat box below so you guys can uh, 
you guys can see it there also. So Joel, thank you again. And uh, everybody else, we will see you guys uh, next week. Same time, same place.